Well, uh, hello everyone. Welcome um, to today's talk on digital chemistry and comp computation. Uh, we were having a uh, small issue with streaming, and I don't know if it's still persisting. So we're recording it in uh, just in case the stream does not work out. Uh, hello, Mr. Cronin. Hi, how's it going? Uh, uh, yeah, it's fine here. Okay. Uh, so uh, I'll I'll just give a small introduction. Now. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, before we start, uh, I'd like to give you a short introduction to, uh, about uh, our speaker, uh, Professor Leroy Cronin. Uh, he's the Regis Chair of Chemistry at the University of Glasgow, UK. Um, if you haven't heard of a Regis Professor, there are positions that have been appointed or have had a royal patronage patron before. And uh, he's been the Regis professor since 2013. So if I'm not wrong, uh, in 2013, um, the Regis professors uh, were appointed on occasion of uh, Queen Elizabeth's Jubilee, Golden Jubilee. So yeah, uh, that's kind of special. And his uh, research interests are uh, in the exploration of assembly of artificial life um, in uh, lab, the digitization of chemistry and self-assembly, Elicitation of fundamentals of information theory in chemistry and the creation of a chemical computer, which uh, the last two are uh, more related to today's talk. Uh, he's uh, he's also uh, he's also one of the he's also worked on uh, assembly theory, which is related to digital chemistry. Again. Yeah, and I think I'll hand it over to him now. Welcome, Mr. Khan. Thanks very much. How long do you want me to talk for? Um, actually, as long as you want to really. uh, I'll try and do it for 45 minutes so people ask questions. So we'll be about one hour in total. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, it's good to be here. Um, and what I'm going to do uh, today is uh, give you, a, I'm just going to share my screen so that you can see that. Let me just check if you can see the screen. Can you see the screen? Uh, yes, yeah, yes. Great. So I'm going to talk to you today about um, the work we're doing in my lab on, chem uh, on digitization of chemistry, but really we're interested in finding out um, what life is and how to make life and looking at um, the origins of life as well as drug discovery. And the talk I'm going to give, I'm going to combine those facets together. Um, it's quite a high level talk. I'm, I'm guessing that most of you are undergraduate students. Um, um, in chemistry, um, so a lot of the concepts you'll, you, you won't find too difficult, but there's quite a lot um, cutting across chemistry, computing science. But I think it's quite fun to discuss in those ways because um, um, it's really important that I try to um, emphasize the overlaps in the field. Anyway, let's get going. So I'm kind of interested in how we can um, find out how chemistry um, kind of turned into biology. So let's put the process in one. So we have a universe which we can describe using the laws of physics. Um, and the universe presumably started with a big bang about uh, 13.8 billion years ago or 14.3, I forget which was the most refined number. And then over a period of time, um, galaxies, stars and galaxies and planets formed Presumably, to get the first planet, you had to have the first stars, and then those stars had to explode. And so there weren't any planets for a little while, right? So the evolution of the universe went stars, and then those stars exploded, and then produced the material to start making planets. And um, we then uh, kind of get across kind of to the main today, where suddenly there's life on our planet. And there's such a big gulf. So what is the mission lab? So my lab, I want, can you let me know if you can see the animations, okay? Can you see the videos moving? Yes, yes we can. Okay. So the mission lab is four things. 
We want to make inorganic life, develop new life forms based upon uh, non-carbon based building blocks. We want to uh, digitize chemistry to, to make molecules using robots. We want to use chemistry to do computation. But all of this is really about understanding how chemistry uh, processes information and what even that is. And the reason that I got to combining these four things together, I've always been interested in how things work, um, the origin of life in particular. But I realized when I wanted to tackle the origin of life in my lab, that I didn't have enough um, time, enough people to do experiments. So I realized I'd have to digitize and make robots to some, do some of these experiments. But I realized the robotics and the chemistry I needed, I needed to find do a new type of uh, computational science to program the robots. And then when I realized it was possible to use computers to program robots to do chemistry, I thought, what about do it the other way around? What about using chemistry to do um, computation? And so this is kind of what my group is doing. We're kind of based in Glasgow. We've been based in Glasgow for 20 years now. And we're really at the nexus between um, computing science, chemistry, biology, physics, engineering, uh, and mathematics. So what I'm going to do in this lecture is I'm going to really talk about three things coupled together. The first thing is about um, complexity in chemistry and what it is, and introduce to you a theory that I've developed called assembly theory. And assembly theory is quite important because it's not, it, for, for me at least, it's a theory um, that I developed um, in the last few years to kind of understand and quantify complexity, not just in chemistry, but in um, all areas of the universe. But actually, the first, the place where I developed it first was in chemistry. And um, why I wanted to do this is I wanted to understand how do we start from scratch in chemical space. So just imagine you are, the Big Bang has happened, there are some galaxies, some galaxies um, have planets. Um, there are solar systems in some of these galaxies. So that means there are stars which have planets around them. And those planets are starting to become alive. What does that look like? How do we even conceive, conceptualize that concept that life may exist elsewhere, firstly, on other planets? How do we search chemical space here even? What do we mean? So I think we. I wanted to kind of start with a, um, the following idea that reactions really don't exist at a priori, that, um, that uh, reactivity exists and chemists exist. So it might seem crazy. Reactions don't exist. What is, what is Lee talking about? Well, what I'm saying is that the, the information contained in a reaction or uh, um, allowing the reaction to occur has extrinsic requirements as well as intrinsic ones. The intrinsic ones are given to you by quantum mechanics, basically reactivity. The extrinsic ones are the temperature required, the, the container required, the concentration required. So this kind of then got me thinking, well, combinatorial explosions, not complexity are wide into chemistry, Chemistry is magic. There are no secret rules to get complex molecules. So how do we get complex molecules? Um, we need to really view that um, complex uh, chemical reactions are, are actually done by what I would call constructors. And a constructor is not a magic chemist, but it is a series of boundary conditions that allows the process to occur. Information doesn't come for free. And this is the number one message I want to give you in this lecture. In chemistry, information is not just uh, a free thing it has to come about somehow so why should we actually a bother to really uh, care about origin of life um you know and, and look for aliens and things like that well there are a number of reasons um the first is the contact of alien life is going to be pretty big that there are lots of false positives out there we don't know what to look for um and we don't really have a universal understanding of what life is. Um, if I then, are, if I ask some of you students, you know, what would you tell me? What is a life form? What does what do you say is alive and not alive? There'd be quite a lot of argument about what you would call alive or not. 
So we don't have an understanding what life is. We also don't have a really good way of getting a hypothesis for life. Um, and what I want to do is I want to make a life detection system that can be sh for sure able to detect an, a new life form, whether it's made in the laboratory or discovered in the universe. So to do that, let's quickly play a game. So, okay, you don't need to unmic or tell me anything, but just look at the screen and I want you to think to yourself, is the object living or dead? So here's some sand, think to yourself, living or dead? Here's a dust mite, is that living or dead? What about this virus? Is it a living or dead? This protein, this car, this molecule. Oh, this is the UK prime minister. This brick, this sand castle, this snowflake, this other molecule here. Someone, when you think about this question of the living or dead, you'd probably say, well, okay, I would probably say that the dust mite was living, the prime minister was living, but everything else looks to be dead. But if I say from evolution or not, you would probably say, okay, well, the prime minister is evolved, the proteins evolved, the dust mite is evolved, the virus particle comes from evolution, the car was made by a human being and a human being was evolved, the sand castle was made by a human being, the human being was evolved, and then the snowflake was not evolved. This brick came from a human being that was evolved, but too simple. But then you've got this molecule, morphine. Was this molecule um, produced by evolution or could it be produced by random chance? That's a question I really want you all to think about. Could this molecule with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, um, uh, carbon atoms and three high, uh, oxygen atoms, one nitrogen, and then a few hydrogens, could this be a randomly formed like a snowflake? Well, the answer is no, and here's why. Complex molecules can't be spontaneous because you need too many parameters to specify their, their um, uh, precise um, requirements. Take this molecule taxol, it has got 47 carbons, 51 hydrogens, one nitrogen, 14 oxygens. It has a molecular weight of 853.33. Uh, and this molecule is so complex, there are more atoms in the universe, um, that the, there are more molecules possible, sorry, than there are atoms in the universe. So what I mean, there are more um, structures of taxol, like, uh, sorry, of a molecule with a molecular formula of taxol possible than there are, more, uh, uh, than there are atoms in the universe. So that means that um, if you find um, taxol and you can determine a single molecule, a unique formula, then you know that it had to be constructed by a life form or an alien or a robot. It couldn't just arise by chance. So what we have to do is to think about how we could determine this using uh, uh, theory. And so what I built was this idea of looking for objects and accounting their, their entropy and their Kolmogorov complexity. So entropy you should be familiar with. Kolmogorov complexity is more uh, uh, tricky technique that you may uh, come across in computing science. But really, um, what, com what entropy tells you about is disorder. What Kolmogorov complexity tells you about is computational or program complexity. Um, um, but what um, I want to understand is how assembled something is. So there is, I think, another quantity that we call assembly, which is different to complexity. Obviously, assemblies can be complex, but it's about the process of building those objects. So what is assembly theory? Assembly theory is actually very simple. It describes the minimum number of physical steps needed to construct a, a given object. We call this the assembly number. The assembly information is a function of the abundance of the object in the assembly number. And the higher the assembly number, the lower the number of objects that were accessible using at random events. So what this means, is that um, if you find a molecule that is complex with a high assembly number, say like taxol, and you find a large number of that molecule, 
And the larger the number, the more unlikely it is that it's been produced randomly. So that's really important to remember. So basically assembly theory tells you about a measurement. If you can measure the assembly number of a molecule and you can detect the molecule, it gives you some boundaries on uh, working out um, uh, the, the likelihood that molecule could have formed by chance. So assembly theory we've been developing for a while now has two key features. So it, uh, it requires the assembly number of the object and the abundance of the objects. And I've already said the bottom line. There's some many applications out there to mathematics, text, images, but really I'm gonna talk in this lecture about molecules. Um, and so if you take a molecule and you break it down into parts, you can try and work out how um, complex the molecule is by its assembly number. So let's just take a look at the example here with these blocks, adding them together, or let's look at the text string, making the word abracadabra. If you read, look here, abracadabra has three, six, nine, 10, 11 letters. So these are letters in abracadabra. If you were gonna take these letters and put them together one by one, you'd need to make 11 operations. But if you use assembly theory, you don't need 11 operations. You just need one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. So actually it's seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We forget the first one. So this means that by, take, by doing seven operations, you can make the word abracadabra quicker than um, if you just made it using the the letters alone. This may seem a bit odd, but, but just don't worry about that for the moment. I'll try and explain, it should come clear. So you can apply this to molecules and then a probabilistic map of the molecule. And what assembly theory allows you to do, let's just take a molecule that requires, say, let's look at this graph here, and let's look at this green dotted line, which corresponds to an assembly index of 15. So what does that mean? Well, this means that, um, this molecule here, if we look at the probability of formation, we did some calculations, and molecules that have an assembly number of 15, the probability of formation is literally one in 10 to the 23. So that's 10 to the minus 23. So what does that mean? That means that if you had a, a mole of molecule, what's well, one in a mole of molecules, so that's really, really vanishingly small probability. So something with assembly number 15, um, um, if you can detect it, then it must be made by biology. That's the bottom line. So anyway, what we did in the lab is we then uh, explored chemical space to track the amount of uh, assembly required. And we use mass spectrometry to kind of start exploring chemical space. You can see here asparagine, the amino acid, only has assembly number of seven. A tryptophan has an assembly number of, um, uh, of, of uh, 12, penicillin 17. So you can get this idea that you suddenly have a detection system to go and detect alien molecules or molecules made by life. We went to the lab, did some mass spec, and we were able to get a correlation between the theory and what we measured in the mass spec. Because then when the, we break the molecule up in mass spec, the number of fragments we could count will, gave us a mapping of the assembly number. So this allowed us to make an experimental measure for how complex a molecule is. So think about it. We can now go to Mars or Venus or Titan and send a mass spectrometer and count how complex a molecule is and then to and see um, if the molecule is an alien life form or not or comes from an alien life form. We've also done this through infrared, and we made an assembly measurement system um, by taking a load of samples from the laboratory and around uh, the world and from outer space. And to cut a long story short, we were able to show that molecules that come from life have a very large um, assembly number above this threshold of 15, as I talked about earlier. So this is really kind of exciting because it says that really we have a detection system that allows us to really um, look for chemicals. And then we can also map chemical space mathematically using assembly theory, such as the molecules you would find in biology. Okay, so that's the first part of the talk. Um, we've basically got an idea for looking at 
um, how complex a molecule is. So the most important point now is to say, okay, we have a way, uh, a detector, an assembly detector to find complex molecules. What about um, looking at different reactions, um, looking at information and reactions? So I wonder if we could work out, if we could use assembly theory to not only look for aliens, but to design drugs and to design new types of avenues for making molecules. Now, we do understand that chemistry has um, information. We, chemistry exists. We do have, a, um, here's an example here of a, a kind of a one pot synthesis of, of adenine, just from hydrogen cyanide. And people have been arguing for a very long time about lo looking at the origin of life and saying, how can we make complex molecules in the laboratory? Where does the information come from? Well, of course, here, there's a recipe that you follow. And the recipe is fairly simple. So you can imagine that going from cyanide to adenine might be easy. And the, and the laws of chemistry do um, um, uh, encode some information. So that means we want to be able to understand how much information is needed for a reaction. And that uh, is important because we want to understand how uh, to develop new reactions and to find the structure of chemical reactions. So now let's go on to the next part of the talk where we're gonna talk about chemical state machines. And I'm gonna to talk to you now about robotics because if we can use a mathematical technique to measure how complex a molecule is, can we use robotics to build complex molecules? And what does that tell us about the, the way to design new molecules and drugs? And I'm calling this a chemical state machine. Now, a state machine is merely a machine that can change state with regard to some program. Um, and the question I want to ask you is, can we program robots to do chemistry? And can we do it in such a way the, pro the robot is able to do all chemistry um, as simply as possible? So do we need to develop a new type of system for abstractions in chemistry? Um, and so abstractions already exist in chemistry. Um, and that's interesting because um, we can basically start to do reaction planning as shown here. So you can take a molecule and you can look, disconnect the molecule into its components. And then you can work out how you'd go and make that laboratory by hand in a manual way. But the problem is you have to do it manually. There's no robotic way. There's no universal way to take a target molecule and come up with a route to make it in the, in, the, in, the, in the lab using the robot. And this is the problem that we are about to solve. And the reason why it's a big problem is you want to be able to take a, a kind of written procedure, like from the text, and interpret what you currently have to take that procedure, interpret it, do an experiment, get a result, and then it's all very manual. You, do, you, approve, you improve it step by step. What about if you could write a code and that code would run a robot and just make the molecule. That's the dream. Can we use code to make molecules? And I would like to compare this idea of going from a, a single class computing machine like an abacus or slide rule to what we have in chemistry today, like a DNA synthesizer, peptide synthesizer, carbohydrate synthesizer. The, some robots do exist, but they are very narrow. They only apply to certain types of chemistry. Can we make any molecule using um, a robot? Well, before we did that, we had to kind of work out how to develop a new type of uh, physical building uh, of molecules. And we call this computation. And computing is like computing. Computing is the concept of turning code into molecules. And to do this, we needed to make a language. So if you look at the stone tablet here, the stone tablet is probably what the alchemists were doing. The calligraphy is what organic chemists are doing. And as we go to the first robotics, the typewriter, and into the digital computer, we're getting more and more general. And to do this, we have to think about building a programming language. Now, I'm sure many of you students are be using uh, computing programming um, in your spare time, in your studies, for fun. Um, and to do this, to build a programming language, or to do programming, you have to understand the abstraction level for, for um, building the programming language. So if you start at the computer, at the way at the bottom of the computer, you have transistors. Those transistors are grouped together to make logic gates. 
This is what you can then put into integrated circuits and chips, and you can then put them into components and architecture in which you layer an operating system, a library, a programming language, and you write an application. So this, the application is the highest level of abstraction. The transistor is the lowest level where it's done. So this is literally uh, the million dollar question. You know, how can you um, 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 uh, start to design a state machine for chemistry that can link the dirty chemistry, the manual labor to the high level stuff? So to do this, what we had to do is to literally make a hello world for chemistry. So obviously this is hello world in a programming language and a punch card. This is hello world in, a, in assembly. And this is hello world in Python. Or well, one thing I should say to you all, please, if you have questions, please put them in the chat um, because they will certainly make time to answer questions at the, at the end of the lecture. So you can see these levels of abstraction. This is down at the hardware. This is down at the architecture, and this is right at a high level abstraction. So you can just write in Python, hello world. To, do, to make a language for chemistry, I had to understand normal language theory and think about the, uh, the way that we, we could make, go from a kind of regular grammar to context-free, uh, context-sensitive, and then recursively enumerable to make this grammar that was a generator. In the same way, you could do this in an automaton to make a push down one, a linear one, and then go to a Turing machine, which is more complex um, um, and, and much more powerful than just uh, a finite automaton. So what do we do? Well, we built a chemical synthesis state machine, um, which we call the computer. And what the computer does, what computation, what well, the computer is capable of computation. What is computation? Computation is the process of running chemical code. We call this KIDL, XDL here, reliably on any compatible hardware. You should compare this to computation, which is like running a program on a digital computer. Now to, do a, to run a chemical program, you have to have a digital input, um, which comprises of a KIDL file and a graph, and it then executes on the hardware to make the molecule. And this really is important because your abstraction of chemical assembly gives you a state machine that can make any molecule material. Think about it. Suddenly now you can program the synthesis of the molecule and you don't have to do manual labor. Inputs are digital and physical, outputs are physical, like molecules. So the way we had to do this is we needed to build a machine that would do this. It was a state machine that would exploit the history of chemistry enable the bench chemists um, today in the lab, help make it easier for them, make it modular, safe, reproducible. And then basically we had to automate the round bottom flask. And automating the round bottom flask um, allowed us to give rise to making this system here. There's pumps and valves connected by um, um, the, this fluidic machine. So then we, what we did is we built the machine and the way we built the machine um, is we had, we had this physical kind of pumps and valves put together um, and then we have a graph of the machine and then we're able then to program the machine using our, our chemical programming language, KIDL. We've got a whole bunch of modules we can add on as well, which I won't go into here. It's not really part of the lecture actually. Just you can do all sorts of chemistry, photochemistry and so on. Anyway, here's, a chemist, here's the actual machine running. So here's the preparation of the reactor. The thing is cleaning. And, and it's running through the four abstractions of chemistry. So the, the first step is the reaction. You can look down here in the run bottom flask. Then after the reaction is done, the, the reaction gets worked up. So this is an extraction. So some of you, if you're doing organic chemistry in the laboratory, uh, you could do this as a liquid liquid extraction. Then we're doing an isolation to isolate the product in the evaporator. 
And then what we will do is we will then um, evaporate the material down to give a product. And then we'll add a solvent to dissolve it that we can then recrystallize it from to purify the, the product. And there we go. And that's the, 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 the stuff now dissolved. And then the final step, we then put it into the crystallizer here. And then it automatically will chill, cool down the liquid, and it will grow and it will precipitate the product. And here you go, the crystallization is happening. And then we can remove the solvent to give you the pure product. And we were able to do this with a number of different compounds. Um, all autonomously with no reconfiguration of the robot. The robot reconfigures itself to make, uh, in this case, nidol, rafinamide, and sininophil. Okay, so that's great. So we've got this robot for chemistry. We've got this KDL file. And what we can do is we can program this type of the, the robot now using a kind of natural language processor that takes literature and helps us populate our KDL space. So we're actually able to put all the operation, identify the operations, identify the, uh, the, the reagents and re identify the conditions for the operations. So you've got the synth reader in this code that you then put in a chemical process with a virtual machine and you compile it. It gives you a, a kind of universal actions, a way of uh, making um, any molecule pretty much in the robot um, readable. And so what you've got is this really interesting um, way of programming the, the chemistry um, very naturally, not using hard code, but using chemical um, um, recipe writing, and you can do it precisely, and that's really important. Uh, we've done quite a lot of chemistry now where we've made a whole bunch of different um, molecules. Um, you can see here, this is what the KDL language compiler comp commands look like. This is shown in the Python implementation. But I should say that KDL is not just a, um, a format that we use in Python. Actually, KDL has become its own um, recursively enumerable um, language. So it, although it's a language that runs on Python, it could actually run in any um, operating system. It's kind of hard to get your head around it because it just looks like it's Python. It's, it's, it's actually its own um, grammar. And you can just see an example here of how we do the procedure, like you know, purpose wash, and it gives you all the different identities. So the, the nice thing about KDL is it's modular, they have composable transformations, there are explicit dependencies, and you can express recursion. That's really important because then we can then use a lambda calculus to basically transform the chemistry, uh, the, the functions, if you like, sorry, um, of the inputs. Um, and then this is super important um, to be able to then uh, recurse uh, reagents through a complicated tree of possibilities. But anyway, we have to start simple because obviously we want to use a computer to make a life form one day, but right now we're using it to make drugs and to synthesize molecules. Here we're doing using it to cross coupling chemistry um, um, and um, um, to make peptides and to make diazarenes. And this is again, what a picture of what the robot would look like. So what we wanna be able to do also is we've got the complexity theory, we've got the assembly theory, we've got the theory of computation, the state machine, and we've built a robot. Can we now combine them together to basically search chemical space um, to make new molecules? So can we make um, a new life form? using this approach, that's the dream. So we want to look at the target specific synthesis avoiding messy stuff. Now to really explore the origin of life here, we've got to be very careful about the observations we make. So what we've been developing in the lab is a Bayesian framework for origin of life, um, soup chemistry. So basically we are sorting out our priors in terms of um, what is the probability for origin of life um, and the probability of um, uh, 
in, within certain chemical chemistries. And what we've got to try and do is think about how we can explore the uh, posterior likelihood of origin of life as a function of the prior probability of origin of life, the observations from the soup, and the no observation from the soup. And that's really an interesting question. So we then had to kind of build uh, a soup machine. So this is what we were looking at here, building this uh, uh, chemical reaction engine to look for um, um, evidence of organization in peptide chemistry. We get patterns of reactivity um, by mixing together the peptide, the amino acids in different minerals and drying them down and using a mass flex workflow. And I think that it's, it's kind of important that we try to quantify um, the degree of complexity. And that's why using assembly theory and looking at assembly number and really counting how many parts does the molecule that you make on these conditions have, that's really important. We're also using um, the approach for our programming language to now program uh, chemical specs really explicitly. So we can now write a code from combinatorial search. This is really the most powerful part of developing the programming language and the computation approach, not just for making known molecules, but for making soup chemistries and looking at unknown chemical space, as shown um, here with this number of reactors connected together in the, in the, in the modular wheel. And here's another view. Um, of a different, slightly different rig next door. And we're looking at the outcomes using mass spec. And this is the code that we have looked at for the process variables, the constructor process variables, the constructor constraints, the analysis and update. Again, all expressed um, in um, this type of assembly uh, theory approach um, and recursive language. So where have we got so far? Well, we've been able to go look at the uh, different soups uh, from, for a few days, and we're starting to use molecular assembly and Bayesian methods to look at the inputs and discoveries. We've generated 100 terabytes of data. So there's a lot of data to look at, a lot of aspect data, and we're looking at the assembly number increase in our soups. And you can see here um, some retention time against M over Z and the intensity, and then looking at different runs and trying to look for difference in, the, in those runs. But in addition to looking at the origin of life, we're also using machine learning to search for chemical reactivity, to try and see if we can engineer new reactions. And so one of the things we've been doing in, in our lab is not just um, using a robot to make known molecules or the origin of life robot to make a soup. We're trying to, um, in a, as simply as possible, combine together a number of different reagents um, in a reactor and look for um, evidence of reaction using NMR and mass spec. And so the way we do it is we, we have a closed loop reactivity engine where we have liquid handling. We continuously assess the, um, um, the reactivity using a neural network. We then have a model and we keep going around in the loop and we try to um, uh, explore the uh, discovery of new organic chemical reactions. So this is really nice. So you've now got a situation whereby we are able to look at molecular complexity using assembly. Um, we are able to analyze um, samples around the world and get some feeling for what molecules look like on Earth. We then went and build, built some robotics to do computation, to computation, sorry, to make complex molecules. And then we started to use the same hardware to make um, uh, soup chemistry and then use machine learning to search for reactivity, but not just machine learning to use assembly theory, which is more agnostic than machine learning because machine learning you have to have, you have to train your system. And if you train it, then you have to introduce um, um, some bias. And then the final part of the talk, just a few slides, we've also been making robots that will make um, um, not just molecules, but complex systems like protocells. And you can see here, we're a robot basically making cells um, that will um, have different chemicals in them. And we look at the behavior of the cells using this web camera. And the idea is to find out if we can get evolution occurring outside in the cell rather than the uh, molecules. 
there's quite a lot of systems we've been playing with um, to look at the, 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 the cells flocking together. Um, and we're also looking at the dynamics inside the cells using different uh, dye structures. And I think what is really interesting to me is that um, we are able to basically get the system to evolve. Um, uh, and we're able to look at the function of the increase in fitness of the objects as a function of number of generations using a genetic algorithm. So, okay, so I think we're getting towards the, the end of a lecture. I've just got one more slide left. I just wanted to, wanted to summarize, say that we've got a new approach to creating life from it. We will have to, we've got a new theory for biology and evolution using assembly theory. We're building a model to simulate the emergence of the biology. Uh, we're then build, building a machine to make it. And we have a metric to try and measure um, the, um, the complexity of the soup using assembly theory. And so um, I think that we are really making big gains on this right now. That's really exciting. It's really hard work, as you can imagine, bringing together people from many different fields and convincing them to work at this intersection. But I have a very talented team. I'm very lucky to have them. And, um, and they're doing a really great job. And I would like to just acknowledge them right now. This is my team. This, this, the photographs are taken in lockdown, so they're all selfies. Um, um, and I'd like to thank these people for funding. And uh, finally, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And I'm very happy to answer any questions. Thank you for having me to your science club. Oh, uh, thank you, Professor, um, for the wonderful talk. Um, so guys, uh, we're open for questions now and uh, we would really like it if you could just unmute and ask it. Um, it it's not an everyday thing that we can just interact with someone like this. If not, I'll read it out. But I would encourage you to um, unmute and talk about it. So the first question, is it from Riddy? Yes, yes. Um, should I read it out? Sure. Uh, so Riddhi is asking, if the assembly number of a molecule is evidence that it has been made by evolution or a life form which has undergone evolution, does it mean the higher a molecule's assembly number is, the longer it took to be formed in nature, that is, it, it is relatively newer in evolutionary time scale? Um, no, not necessarily. I think right now, the best thing, because it's a good question, by the way, I think the assembly number is really just um, an indication of whether an evolutionary process or a technological process was involved. It, would, it could be, though, when we make the tree of molecules in terms of assembly numbers, we will see how evolution has worked over time. And that way you'll be able to get a time scale. So you can't just get out of one molecule, but looking, looking at the network of molecules, because I think at the origin of life, maybe the molecules used by biology were a little bit simpler than now, and we should be able to make some uh, trace, but we should think about networks of molecules rather than individual molecules. But it's a really good question. So, uh, next is Sahil's question. The two enantiomers- Sahil to share. Can I ask? Yeah, sure. Yes. Hello, Dr. Cronin. So my question is, do two enantiomers have the same uh, MA index? Yes, they do. Uh, so, but uh, shouldn't it be that an enantio excess mixture should be more complex than a racemic one? No. Uh, but- uh, That's a really interesting point. So the, this is where it's really interesting. So intrinsically, the two enantiomers have the same um, MA, but clearly when you have, let's say there's three kind of um, um, possibilities. There's one where there's a mixture, just a racemic mixture. The second one is um, the, the mixture, the, um, the, um, the uh, excess one, where you've got one where you've got a huge excess and one with a small excess. 
So although the assembly number of the molecules are the same, the assembliness is different. So what I mean is the abundance of the molecule, if there's a high abundance of one over the other, then you get a higher assemblyness, and that's more of an information measure. And that's a function of the concentration. So concentration times assembly, okay, gives you the assembly number, but then you can sum it up. Now, when you've got 50-50, you've got equal, so you've got same MA, right, um, of each molecule and the same concentration. So the assembly number, let's say, uh, is, is one value. But when you've got a higher concentration um, in, the, in the overall, because you normalize it, the, the larger you have of the one molecule, it adds more um, information. So that gets taken into account of, it's quite difficult to explain in the mathematics. So whereas intrinsically those molecules are the same, it's the copy number um, that really helps sort that out. But it's a really, really good question. Thank um, you. We, I think we're, do, do, you, do you like the answer? Are you convinced by that? Uh, not 100%, but... Uh... So is it because you don't understand it or because you think it's not correct? I didn't understand it completely. So okay. my point is, if you have an inertial excess mixture, then the stability wise, that mixture will try to get into a racemic one. Exactly. Over time, yeah. but you can do, but you can do work, can't you, on a racemic mixture to purify it. And that means the complexity of that mixture, the uniqueness is higher and it is captured. So you, you, you can think of it like the, although the enantiomers don't have, do have the same MA, an enantiomer excess mixture does have a higher assembliness. So A, assembly, is yeah. equal to the E to the power of assembly number times the log of the concentration or normalized. So you see what I mean? Oh, okay, fine. So uh, the larger the enantiomer excess, the more would be its assembly number, like that. The more the assemblyness. Assemblyness yeah, yeah. is a function of assembly number and concentration. Think of assemblyness like entropy, oh. but in reverse. Your question is beautiful. It's a really deep question. Uh, you know, it's a very, very smart question. So well done for asking it. I was very interested in. And we seem to have skipped somebody's question about someone. There was another one. Is Samant? Do you want to ask your question? Uh, yes, sir. My question was uh, in outer space, uh, there is news that uh, um, organic. I want to ask if uh, which is the molecule of the highest assembly number that we have discovered yet? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think, to be honest, the assembly number of the most, so the, the highest assembly number we found in space, I think, in a meteorite is about 10 or 12 maximum. So it's really below the threshold. Okay, sir, thank you. Uh, hi, am I audible? Hi. Uh, so Dr. Fernand, I had a question. So your assembly theory basically measures in terms of the number of steps in synthesis needed, right? So uh, does it take into account the possibility that even for a molecule that has a, uh, like a large number of synthetic steps, synthesis steps, it's possible that the reactions that are required are essentially same in the mechanism. So that way a molecule could be more biased irrespective of the number of steps in synthesis. If it's essentially following a certain number of uh, a given small set of reactions, uh, is that possible? Yeah, so, so uh, it's a nice question. So assembly theory doesn't do anything, tell you anything about synthesis mechanism. It's about probability. So what that means is that if you, um, if you um, look at the number of steps, when you're saying, well, would a molecule re re with repeated given mechanism be biased to get high production and a molecule with different steps, irrespective of size, that's not quite right because you have to do stuff to those steps, right? You have to put information in, whether it's concentration or starting and stopping the reaction. Now, if you're just repeating it again and again, then you're not really gonna generate 
if you're just repeating the reaction again, then you're just going to add on the same thing to your your um, to your molecule. So the assembly number is not going to go up very much. It's just going to add one because you're adding the same motif, right? It's a bit like in a say a protein or something. So, but there that so they, that's my two points. The first point is assembly theory tells you about is probabilistic and got nothing to do with synthesis. It just to, tells you what chance it has. It's made randomly. But the second point I'm making about synthesis, when if you use assembly theory in the synthesis, when you repeat something, you're just adding the same thing on again and again. So it, it's not going to be that more that much complex. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Good question. Uh, Prabha, would you like to uh, ask your question? Okay, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, my question is basically like when we are using AI for synthesis of chemicals or basically uncontrolled uh, uh, synthesis of chemicals, it's highly probable that we could come across a chemical which could be potential for human life or the world in general. So are there any precautions taken um, in regard of this, uh, in this regard, so that we can avoid such a mishap and any legal restrictions which uh, like restrict your research to this? Yes, yeah, that's a good question. So the, the quick answer is that I think using AI doesn't really increase the likelihood of you making a dangerous molecule. It, it does increase the likelihood of you making an unknown molecule and that unknown molecule could be toxic. But of course, all chemicals are toxic uh, in some way. And so really we just have to use the existing um, legal safety framework to be basically make sure everything is safe. Um, are there any legal restrictions? Sure, there are legal restrictions. You know, if you're using robotics to make molecules and some of the molecules are um, uh, potentially um, illegal, you know, drugs or something, then it would be the local uh, law wouldn't allow you to make them, but I think that the but I think that the question you've asked is very good, but I don't think it's special to robotics. I think to any chemist in the lab, but it but it's something we must consider very seriously. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, ma'am. Can I go? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Hi, Lee. This is Sudha Rajamani here, not a student. We met about seven or eight years ago at LC. I'm not sure you remember me. Very fascinating talk. Um, I, mm -hmm. had, I had two questions. I was wondering, uh, given this amazing computation stuff that you're doing, I was, I was wondering how, how far are we from uh, actually untangling the messiness in the prebiotic soup and how soon can we actually get some fundamental answers for understanding how chemistry might have transitioned to biology? Five years, uh, 10 years? No, I think we've done it. <laughs> so I think in the next 12 months, you'll see a series of papers coming out where we'll explain. I mean, it's gonna cause arguments, right? Because the problem of origin of life chemistry is um, the culture is a very complicated one, let's say. Correct. <laughs> Um, but um, which is one of the reasons why I opted to take an entirely new approach mathematically to the system. I think, so I think that's going to come in the next year. But I think what's more important is how can we make sure that the tools we're using, new researchers can use to basically explore complex chemical systems, systems, chemical systems, they couldn't approach before. And how would that be useful into making pro, pre, you know, prebiotic life forms mm. and maybe engineering things in synthetic biology as well. I think that's going to take slightly longer, three, four, five years, because it's going to require other people to copy and get involved. But I'm giving mm. away the programming language. The programming language is free. Mm -hmm. And also, there, I'm also finding a way right now to make the robotics cheaper so I can give some robots away to groups or all around the world uh, in different countries so we can start to collaborate using the same code. Wouldn't it be cool if you had some code in your lab from my lab and I had some code in my lab from your lab, you know, uh, making uh, molecules? It would be really awesome. 
that was almost segueing uh, to my second question. So you're saying that you're trying to make the robotics cheaper because from what I can see, you have an unbelievable amount of funding and that's pretty limiting in our parts of the world. So to try and come up with something like that is probably close to impossible at this point. So uh, yeah, yeah, that'll be really cool to uh, have some of these things sort of uh, given away uh, on a, f how do you say that, pro bono basis so that we can yeah, I mean, start doing. I was going to say, I think, you know, it's really important to make the robots cheap so you can access them. Absolutely. I think that the stuff, I mean, okay, we have funding, um, but the actual cost of the robot is really quite, so I'd like to express the cost of the robot and let's take the basic one, forget the benchtop NMR machine, mass spec, all that stuff. Okay. But the cost of the basic computer is really not very much more than the stir a hot plate. What? Wow. So if you, yeah, so I reckon right now the computer costs about say five top class stir a hot plates. That's still expensive, right? So mm -hmm. we need to get it, we need to drop it even lower, but I mm -hmm. think it's gonna be doable. And I, and I think what we've got to try and do is play on the ingenuity of people. Um, mm -hmm. Particularly in India, there's a lot of people programming and doing uh, hacking and, pro and uh, building mechatronics. So what yeah. we've got to try and do is make sure that KIDL can be used mechatronically in inventive ways. So mm -hmm. I'm very happy to collaborate with people to say, what are your financial constraints? And more than financial, what are your material constraints? And then we try and do something that um, um, is useful within those constraints. Awesome, so awesome. Giving stuff away pro bono, I don't like, because what it does, I mean, I can give stuff away, but it's kind mm -hmm. of patronizing, isn't it? It's like, oh yeah, you're too poor, have something. What you, no. want to do, <laughs> what you want to do is give some stuff away, but also enable people to basically make what you're doing better. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool, very cool. Uh, we'll be in touch, thank you. No problem, thanks for your questions. Uh, would anyone else like to ask any more questions? I think Amrita had a question. Amrita, you want me to ask it instead? I would like you to ask the question too. <laughs> okay. So the other important question, uh, which pertains to synthetic organic chemistry, I guess, I guess the, I guess a whole bunch of us that are listening to the talk are wondering: Are we now going to make sure that the synthetic organic chemists become obsolete if this really takes over big time and then can do everything? I mean, it seems to be doing things so much more efficiently than say humans could, right? So. That I think there's two answers to the question. The, the short answer is no. We need organic chemists, but we need to do them differently. Organic chemists will need to do different things because, you know, uh, experts thinking about reactions and purification and making more complex molecules. You know, the, um, I suppose, if you think about shift in technology, when the typewriter was invented, mm. all the calligraphers stopped writing. They started typing. When the world processor was invented, people stopped using mechanical typewriters. Then if you think about when you go into automation, I suppose, and in, I'm living in a little village north of Glasgow, it used to be a mill town. So it used to be where I have used water mills to process wool to make uh, textiles. And obviously now it's done by robots. So um, I think the organic chemist needs to learn new skills to design. There's more molecules in a, of a potentially available than there was hours left in the universe. So what that means is the organic chemist is now gonna have more dreams come true. The organic chemist can make more molecules they could ever make before. And there's so many drugs that need to be discovered, you know, so many new functional materials. I think the organic chemist is gonna be incredibly busy. In fact, the, 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 the computation is gonna mean there are gonna be more organic chemists in the world, not less. But think about it. Now the standard of the chemistry will be maintained. Mm. Um, the safety will increase. You know, there has been a tendency, right, from the, 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 the um, say from the UK and the US to outsource ma chemical manufacturing to mm. China and India and, Vietnam, and you know, different countries. And the, 
employment laws are different and the safety standards are different. And I think we have the good thing about, say, computer programmers, say, in India and computer programmers in the UK is they have the same kind of standards. And I bet the Indian programmers in some regards are better because they probably have a better mathematical training. Um, um, so wouldn't it be great if we have um, it's a, this, we have some kind of normalization that basically the tools are make people safer and less tired, but the creativity is unlocked. So I think that that's what we have to try and do. We're not going to replace the chemist, um, but the chemist will be doing different things. I like that answer. It's got a very positive outlook. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Professor Lee Cronin. I just have one small question, which is like the kind of robot that you have shown, robotic arm that you have shown is actually liquid handler. Suppose uh, if I have a solid sample, does your robot also take care of that? I mean, how does yeah. it pay basically? So, say that again. Suppose if I have a solid reagent, uh, will your robotic arm actually weigh that and then transfer the sample in the solid form or you have to dissolve it and then keep it in the whatever reagent section? So there's a number of options. So we do have a solid handling. I, I used to think that solid handling was a big problem, um, but actually it's not a big problem. You can do a number of two ways. You could do it just the way you said. You can weigh the material out by hand and put it in a reagent flask and then when you're ready to use it, add the solvent. Or you can have a little dispenser. And I've designed with my group a little solid handling dispenser, which is a wheel rotated and it out, it, you just weigh the stuff into the wheel and it rotates it in. So we're playing around with those ideas at the moment. And, um, and you know, remember the, the, the robot in the lab isn't meant to replace everything. The chemist is required to set up a reaction, weigh everything out, right? It's, it's not about just removing all those parts. I would say 90% of all the time a chemist is doing is liquid handling. 90% of the time moving liquids around, extractions, purifications, all this stuff. So if we can replace that with the robot, then it's easier. And also most reaction steps, they don't have that many solids. So you can always put the solid in at the beginning and just you think about it and it designs it differently. So um, solid handling isn't as big a problem as I thought. It can be a problem, particularly when solids precipitate in the wrong place. It can break the robot. Um, but yeah, we, we haven't had a big, uh, big problem. There is some groups are using mobile robots to move around and move solids around, but that's incredibly expensive. Um, and um, we have we've adopted a, a kind of more pragmatic approach to help the chemists. But it's a good question. Thank you. Uh, actually, we are trying to develop a screw feed for a different purpose, actually, so that we'll put the sample in the top and then there will be a screw and then which will be moving. And then along with that, the sample will be going down so that it can be controlled also. Yeah, we developed a screw feed as well. But the problem with the screw feed is they're very, very um, prone to clogging up. Yeah. So if you want, I can show I don't. I can show you, um, do, I have, do I have a movie of uh, what the, the, let me, one second, I might have a, uh, um, a movie, um, I can show you what the, the thing looks like. Let me, uh, do I have it here? Uh, one second. I might have a movie I can show you. Um, oh. um, Uh, where is it? Here we go. All right, one second. Okay, so. Right, I'm just going to share my screen again. One second. Uh, uh, stop. Right, share again. Right, can you see that? Yep. So basically, um, it's a little, so you can see the items are in the wall. It's, this is, let's see if we can just rotate it around. So this is, you can see how it works. Yeah, but okay. yeah. And so I've, I've made another version, which um, I, I can't show here because I haven't finished um, 
organize it all, but basically it has a big thing in the top, like a hopper. And yes, the wheel absolutely. Rotates absolutely. Around. Yeah, th this is more like a kind of uh, what we use for uh, uh, the control addition of the liquids, uh, what the pump that is called as. But yeah. uh, that other one, hopper type, uh, that's what we have designed with a hopper and then the long axis is there. And yeah, with that, so with our hopper, we have no long axis, just a screw. Just, yeah, sorry, just a screw and then that rotates. I mean, yeah. Yeah, that can be connected to a hopper. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And again, I mean, I have sent earlier an email to you, but of course, I mean, you're busy, so I could not get any reply. Suppose if we have to introduce digital chemistry to the undergraduate education, so what do you think the students of uh, undergrads or maybe uh, master's level or PhD students should be equipped with? Um, yeah, so, I, I'm design, so I'm designing a course right now. Okay. Um, and it will be probably be ready by Christmas. So if you contact me in a few months, I can give you the synopsis. But roughly, what you want is you want to teach the students about um, molecular identifiers, um, databases, then some basic programming skills, and then using an RD kit. And then we then need to teach people about programming, chemical programming, basic robotics, reactions, machine learning. And so there's quite a few modules you can put together, but it's not that complicated. I think kind of a fusion of chemical, you know, a fusion of what happens in chemical engineering and computer science and chemistry could be quite nice, but to update the chemist. And I think I wouldn't do it too quickly because I think in the next two years, there's going to be so many advances, it would be then good to establish the, the, the undergraduate course uh, as it, that goes along. But, but certainly I have a synopsis I'm writing just now. Oh, okay. So I'll contact you maybe around that time. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Professor Cronin, I, I have a question. Okay. Yeah. So the uh, so thing is that probably I, I did not. Okay. Sorry. Uh, I think I did not follow the first part. So the, my, my question is that when you, when you synthesize something robotically, do you already know the mechanism of the reactions and then you program it? Or uh, given a molecule, do you do a retrosynthetic synthetic approach and then fit it in the machine? Fit so it. there's three there's three types of approaches. The first one we're doing right now is we're taking the known literature and making those right. So what you know already. The second one is we're taking molecule uh, literature that's uh, reactions that are unknown but should work and optimizing them and making the code. And the third thing we're doing is we're trying to discover entirely new reactions and then turn that into code. So and we've almost, almost got a secret database of new reactions that we haven't published yet that we're putting yes. into the robot. Uh, yeah, so that was my question. So uh, second question was that, is it possible to find out new reactions by random uh, combinations of the known mechanisms? So, so how do you approach that particular, uh, you know, uh, finding a new molecule or new reactions? Do you use the existing reaction mechanisms, combine them with the known uh, molecule thing and then find out something? You can do that, but that only gives you that, that doesn't give you terribly new things. It gives you some, it gives you some new stuff, but not that novel. But if you go um, and you just search reactivity, you can get really new novelty, I think. Okay, thank you. Okay, so does anyone else have any more questions? Okay, I think we're probably finished by the looks of it. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I'm guessing there are no more questions. Uh, yeah. Okay. So it has so, to be oh yeah so, so i had a question okay quickly because i have to go in a few moments so. yes sir so whenever you are uh, writing a code for a particular reaction which has already been discovered so there are also certain things that can go go wrong in a particular reaction for example like in a polymer reaction there can be auto acceleration and hence a lot of 
uh, release of heat and also in certain other catalysts the reaction there can be a lot of heat release so that can lead to say explosion or fire so do you also write a disaster management code along with it or is it something that is automatically take, taken care of in the while the reaction goes on no when you're writing up the reaction you have to you have to look at the safety aspects and make sure we do have the knowledge base where the system will start to identify potential dangerous hazards um, if that's what you mean and will prevent you from doing them and so there's almost uh, one, one of the things we're trying to do is have a, a, a database of blacklisted reactions that you don't want to do because they'll explode <laughs> okay okay so um i'd like to uh, me and all the other coordinators of science club would like to thank professor cronen for making time for this talk it has been an absolute pleasure to host you sir thank you very much um, and it's been a pleasure to come and speak to you today so take care everybody thank you a lot see you later bye bye and i'd also like to thank all of our audience for attending it today yeah thank you for coming very guys very really good questions Thank you again to everyone uh, for being very interactive and not sticking to the text box. See you later. Bye bye. Bye bye.